Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. You spend a significant portion of your life at work, so my goal is to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I am delighted to welcome my very special guest to the show today, Patrice Washington. Patrice, welcome. I'm so excited to have you on the show. No, I'm more excited to be here with you, Caroline. (laughs) Well, thanks, my dear. We're going to talk about your amazing book and all the wonderful things that you are doing in the world to empower women. But let me tell the the audience about you. Patrice C. Washington has dedicated her life to moving the masses from debt management to money mastery. Love that. Since 2003. As a featured columnist, television commentator, radio host, author, speaker, and leading authority on personal finance for women and youth. Patrice is intentional about keeping her message on money management practical and upbeat. Patrice's down-to-earth advice has been featured in numerous articles, quoted in dozens of newspapers and magazines, and appeared on hundreds of radio stations and television networks, including Bloomberg TV, Forbes, The Huffington Post, CNN Money, and Black Enterprise. So each week, 8 million listeners tune into her Real Money Answers segment on the nationally syndicated Steve Harvey Morning Radio Show. As a transformational speaker, she is invited to conferences, churches, colleges, nationally to electrify, entertain, and educate, and most importantly to her, inspire action in thousands of families monthly. Patrice, you truly are an inspiration, but I'd love (laughs) to just start from the beginning. How did you get inspired to empower people to have healthy relationships with money? Well, you know, it it actually started when I uh, became a real estate, a licensed real estate professional at 19 years old while I was a sophomore in college and went on by my senior year in college to become a real estate and mortgage broker. And it was at that time that I realized that although most of my clients were much older than me, they didn't know anything about money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's not a requirement to be older and wiser, right? Right, right. They didn't know really basic things about money. And I'm just one of those people who was raised to believe that you're blessed to be a blessing. And the way that I've always learned is by actually giving back and teaching everything that nice. I learn as soon as I do. And so in my real estate business, while I was on a quest to learn all the things about money that I never learned growing up either, uh, I found it to be really, I guess, therapeutic and really helpful to share everything I was learning with my clients. So my real estate and mortgage company grew to a seven figure business by my uh, around my 25th birthday, um, really because I had a heart to go out into the community all over Southern California and share everything that I was learning about budgeting and credit improvement and uh, preparing yourself for home ownership and all that stuff. I was just sharing the information freely. Um, and that's how the business grew. And that's how my love for financial education truly began. So you truly pay it forward and help others. That's amazing. You know, I love the title of your book, Real Money Answers for Every Woman, How to Win the Money Game with or without a man. And I think, <laughs> I think this is incredibly important. My, my listening audience is diverse, but I would tell you that the majority are women, as you know. And you also know this, but I want to say it for our listening audience. Women account for $7 trillion, and that's a T, of money that is, that is uh, spent in the U.S., earned mm-hmm. and spent. You know, we are the major money movers in this country, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we are fiscally responsible for our money. So tell me a little bit about the book and how how that theme came to be. Well, I really felt like I had to include that tag, how to win the money game with or without a man, because I was traveling all over the country, helping, again, speaking at churches and conferences and all this stuff. And it never felt, Caroline, I would would be out back uh, in the back of the room signing books and a woman would come up to me and go, you know, I think what you do is cute, but my husband, you know, takes care of all of that. So I don't really worry about the money. I'm not really concerned about that. And I kept reading these statistics which I'm sure you've heard, you know, that 56% of women will enter retirement alone. It's nearly 60% of us, whether 
that's because of a choice to stay or remain single or because, unfortunately, of the early demise of a spouse or a divorce or separation, whatever it is. But the reality is, whether it's voluntarily or involuntarily, we will be left to take care of our finances. And I just want women to step up and be prepared. And I want us to remember that a man is not our financial plan. So whether he's in the picture or not, we always, or your partner, whomever, we always still have to take personal responsibility for our personal finance. And that that's my message and I'm sticking to it. I'm with you, my dear. <laughs> it's all about responsibility and accountability. And another interesting statistic that I heard the other day, for the first time in American history, there are more women for whatever their own personal reasons are, choosing to be single than to get yeah. partnered or married. So again, that is a new demographic of single professional working women who are really it's essential for them to manage their finances. Absolutely. And you know what I find, Caroline, that even though, you know, more and more women are making a choice to stay single, they're still not necessarily correlating that choice with being proactive about their finances. Ah, okay. Because I find that, you know, we've made great strides in education and we've made phenomenal strides career wise. Um, but, you know, but even our confidence, you know, I talk about in the book, uh, there's a whole section about earning more money. Even our confidence in having conversations around money is not quite caught up to yeah. everything that we've done, right? So a lot of women that I find are still uncomfortable having those uh, conversations about money with their friends, with their family, uh, being able to say no, <laughs> being yeah. able to ask for more in the workplace. There's a lot of, of work that we still have to do. And that's why I think that the work that both of us do is so important. Thank you. I agree. And I'm with you there, my dear. We are kindred spirits and that we are <laughs> wanting to empower others. So you mentioned a few, but there are there additional differences between how men and women manage their money? You know, in addition to Real Money Answers for Every Woman, I also ended up writing Real Money Answers for Men. Mm. And that was because so many of the fellas that were reading their wives or their girlfriends or their sister's <laughs> books were going, what's up with the pink book? This yeah, is good yeah. information. You know, you could have done one for us. And so I took a year, um, well, actually about 10 months, I'll say, to do a focus group with over 100 men, different demographics all over the country, um, who really gave me feedback about this and helped me tap into what are the real differences. And so I don't find that there are many differences in the management piece. Piece, but I did find some really interesting information about just the behavioral piece and some of the mindset. For example, um, a lot of the fellas believed, um, you know, that if they wanted to leave their job and go follow their passion, live their lives and, you know, just be happy doing right. what they love. You know, the, the people around them and particularly the women who depend on them weren't necessarily that gung ho about it. Uh -huh. Whereas for a man, he felt like, well, if my wife wants, if she's tired of her job or she's overworked and underpaid, I'm going to encourage her to go follow her passion. But I don't have the same liberty. So a, a lot of men felt a lot more stuck which yeah. I was surprised by yeah. um, a little, I have to be honest. Um, and so it really, it changed the way that they thought just about managing money in general and what their roles and responsibilities were. And then I also found that, um, you know, we think that men are quicker to say no or have it easier saying no about finances or about lending money or borrowing or co-signing, but they were suckers too, Caroline. Yeah, they yeah. <laughs> So there were a lot of similarities. And I. so the reason that I still put how to win the money game with or without a man, again, it's not because that I see that there are so many differences between us. I just felt like women needed... You needed a girlfriend. A lot. If you read the reviews on Amazon about the book, a lot of women say, I feel like she's my big sister or my girlfriend who just wants to help me be better. Right. And There's a trust yeah. factor that you've earned. I think that's huge. And I think it's you've created, I know, you've created this beautiful safe space for women to be able to ask those difficult questions from an expert like you who's going to give them candid advice. And keep it real. Yeah, always. absolutely. <laughs> so, Patrice... Allow me to go into the dreaded D word, which is debt. And you have been so candid and forthcoming about how very early on, as a recent college grad, you yourself had some debt and you found yourself sinking fast. And, you know, so much of America is struggling with debt right now. So what are some of the lies that keep us in debt and, and how do we get out of that scenario? 
You know, so I, I'm glad you asked that because I did start the book um, with the myths and the attitudes and beliefs that keep us in debt. And so I've been all over the country doing these live television interviews at all the major stations in big cities. And I was uh, on a particular station on the West Coast and the woman said, well, those lies that you're talking about don't apply um, to people who've really gone through things. So I'm, I'm prefacing by saying even if you have not been out spending all your money on bags and shoes and clothes, there are still some mindset things oh, yeah. going on that could be keeping you behind. And one of them, I'll tell you, is, you know, um, I'm just a giving person. Mm, yeah. I hear that so often. Well, I'm just a giving person. And, you know, as women, I love the fact that we're nurturers and we're caregivers and we want everyone to be okay. But sometimes we give to the point of our own deprivation. Yes. And when you continue to give, um, and give and give and give and you don't know when to say no and when to cut it off that doesn't serve you and it doesn't serve the person that you think you're helping you know I, I, I heard uh, someone say a, a while ago um, the best way to help someone sometimes is to stop helping them right right and and as women we tell ourselves this lie well I have to help because I'm a giving person and oh I'm so noble but there's nothing noble about being broke. There's no nobility yeah. of being broke. Steve Harvey is my mentor and he says, um, the best thing you can do for a broke person is not become one of them. It's true. Yeah. You don't <laughs> want to be codependent, you know, and create right. that reliance. Right. So a myth that we, you know, a lie that we tell ourselves that might hold us back is that I'm just a giving person. Another one of my favorites, and I'm sure you've heard this because you deal with the workplace stuff, is well, I work hard and I deserve it. <laughs> You're right. I hear that all the time. I hear that all the time. It is, it is how we justify financial mismanagement. I find that when people, especially when you're not in a job or in a career that aligns with your purpose, that aligns truly with what your authentic self should be doing day in and day out. Like you said in your intro, we spend most of our time at work, right? Yes. And we, we want to be in a place that fulfills us. And I find that when people are not fulfilled, Caroline, it's so much easier to fall into financial mismanagement because we end up on a Friday, it's payday, and we end up, no no idea who drove us there or how we got there, but we end up at a mall yeah. or online surfing <laughs> or something, and the next thing you know, we're going, I don't need these shoes, but I work hard and I deserve it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Or I don't need to take this trip with my girlfriends, but I work hard and I deserve it. And so it's it's telling yourself that one little lie over and over again that ends up getting us in big trouble. It's that I find that difference between need and want. And, and I've really learned over the years, and I'll be honest, it took time as I became more fiscally responsible and really, uh, you know, solvent and planning for my financial future as well. Do I need it or do I want it? And there yes. are two differences, right? Because it's pretty rare that I really need it. And it's pretty easy to say, yes, I want it. You know, and I remind people that needs and wants change for different people at different times in their lives. Right. Yes. So there might be a time in your life if you have children where, OK, you need, um, you know, you need to put aside extra money for the babysitter or caregiver or whatever that is. But then as they get older, that's not a need for you anymore. But you want to go out with your girlfriends. Right. So you're like, well, it, then you're still calling it a need. But now it's more of a want because your child is older and can maybe manage themselves a little better. It's, it's just that you have to think through each and everything. And I always ask myself as well, because I think we've all been here, you know, not only is it a need or a want, I also go deeper and say, am I making an investment or am I just ah. spending money? Ooh, I like Cause, that. Because if I you're like making that. an investment in a person, place or thing, then you can expect a return. Yeah. But if you're spending money, you're just going to feel good for that moment. And oh, that's, that's it. Brilliant. That's brilliant. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to share that with the world and, and cite you. That's brilliant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, I have to say, Patricia, one of the things I love about your book is it's filled with such good content and action steps. I mean, it really is this guide to being savvy and successful and solvent. And you give us very particular checklists and action steps and you, you educate us. I think one of the problems from my perspective, dealing with amazingly successful professional women who earn a lot of money. They don't have the financial wherewithal un unless they, they, they are in that field uh, to really understand how to be wise and savvy with their money. So this is the best resource to help women understand what their obligations are, what they should do in a step-by-step -step way. So I thank you. Aww. 
Thank you so much. That means a lot because I really wanted to be a no fluff author, right? I yeah. didn't want to fill the book with a whole bunch of theories and this. I just want people to be able to take action and do it immediately. Yeah. And I wanted to leave no ambiguity. It's like any, that's why it's written the way it is. It's an easy read. It's a Q and a format. And I want you to leave it on your nightstand yes. and be able to refer to it over and over again. Like yeah. you might not need the debt section now, but maybe a year from now you will. And you'll be able to pick it up and go, this is the exact way I need to communicate with my creditors. And that's what I love. You don't have to read it, you know, start to finish. You can flip around and go to sections that are relevant to you. I've got it dog-eared and highlighted <laughs> and paper clipped. And just to give our readers a glimpse, too, you have these real talk sessions and these affirmation and these real money sections. So, again, it just speaks very authentically and in a way that is uh, comprehensible. So I thank you. So let's wow. talk a little bit, though, since... Uh, you know, it is an interesting scenario when you're in a partner or relationship or a marriage. Should couples keep that secret stash of money? <laughs> well, you know, I get that question all the time. Damn. And I always, I always, 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 especially tell women, because a lot of us, we, we got that advice from well-meaning moms and dads yeah. and, Different and grandmas, yeah. <laughs> right, who are like, baby, you better keep something to the side. You yep. know, you never know what's going to happen. And they mean well. But here's the thing I always ask women. Because you have to really ask yourself, why is it that I feel the need to keep a secret stash? Truly. If I truly did the work, not based on what grandmama said or big mama said. Like, mm -hmm. what? what is the reason that I truly feel that I need to have a secret stash? Because that, that might mean that there's some trust issues there. Yeah. And, and. I believe that when you start to erode trust in a relationship, I've been married for nine years. I've been with my husband for 13 years. You know, when you start to have trust issues in one area, where else do you allow that to spill over? Like, where do the secrets get to stop? Yeah. So I'm not saying that I don't believe that women should have their own account. I really believe in a his, hers, and ours system mm -hmm. or his, yours, or, you know, hers, yours, and ours, whatever works for you, right? But not that it's a secret. Exactly. The secret part is the part that really, you know, doesn't sit well with me. And I, I had to ask myself. And I, I came from a, a grandma that was saying the same thing, keep money to yourself. But when I looked at my husband and thought about keeping a secret stash, I'm like, where do we draw the line? What kind of secrets can he keep? If I can keep secret accounts with thousands of dollars in it, well, what, you know, does he have another family somewhere? No. <laughs> No, but I understand. Yeah, you know? that, it, it does. It erodes trust. And I think our, our grandmothers, you know, were, were well-meaning in take care of yourself, <laughs> you know, and be conscious. But I think you can do that in an honest and open and authentic way with your right. loved one. Right. It's all about being able to have the conversation. You know, so often we hear that um, divorce is typically caused, number one, by money. And I really don't believe that's the case. I believe it's communication about money. And I think that so often, well-meaning couples, we end up bumping heads about money because we don't even understand, first and foremost, not how much do you make, but what does money mean to you? Exactly. Exactly. That's the question. And when we can start to get to the root of, of those types of questions, what does money mean to you? You know, what are your goals? What, what, what can we create together? How can we support each other? Then it's not, you don't keep secret stashes. You know, it's just, this is my account, you have your account, and then this is what we're working on together. And I just see it go so much better for couples when they're open and honest, but you have to get your relationship to a point where you can be open and honest. And I think it starts back to what we talked about originally, when you start lying, stop lying to yourself, <laughs> then you can stop lying to everyone else. And isn't it interesting because money impacts relationships. It, mm -hmm. it not only our collegial, our professional, our loving family relationships. It's not yeah. just this separate uh, esoteric thing. It's, it, it permeates everything we do. Absolutely everything. That's why in the fourth section of the book, Relationships and Money, I don't just talk about your honey and your money. I also talk about how to deal with friends and family, you know, and I talk about how to even deal with kids because I go all over the country, Caroline, speaking at these colleges and boy, I tell you, 
It's a different time. It is a different time. You know, those $5 lattes really add up at Starbucks. So let's talk about that. You you speak beautifully in your books about how mothers can teach their children about money, but let's even think more broadly. You know, young college students who might be on their parents' dollar right now, but eventually they're going to be on their own. So what kind of lessons can we learn early on to be more responsible with our money and more aware? Right. Well, one of the first things I think is just being realistic. Yeah. You know, all my books are real money answers because I I truly just believe that if we kept it simple and went back to just keeping it real, um, we would be so further along, you know, as as a country, really, just simple yeah. principles. And in and I have a book, Real Money Answers College Life and Beyond for college students, where I teach them first and foremost, know your numbers. Yeah. Not your parents' numbers. Not Don't stop thinking about their pockets and digging in their pockets because the best thing about childhood is that yours is now over. <laughs> you're, you're older and you have to become responsible, yeah. right? And as much as your mom calls you her baby, you're not a baby you're not. anymore. Yeah. You know, and you have to know your numbers and it's about getting real. And I really encourage people to stop making these fake, you know, make believe budgets. Budgets are not when you look up in the sky and go, oh, I think it's about, I don't know, it's around. I can't tell you how many college students have no idea, you know, how much is even being paid for them on a monthly basis. And unfortunately, I blame parents because we want to protect our children and keep them from reality, But it's reality. And if we don't start to let them in on what it truly takes to keep them in school or to to help them out, um, what their expenses are, what, you know, then they continue to think it's okay for them to buy $5 Starbucks every day. Right, right. You, you don't earn enough to do that. And you should know that. And, and because... when you graduate with that entry level job, you will not be able to afford that. So don't get right. into that habit now. Yeah. Right. And heaven forbid with this student loan debt crisis that we're in right now, and this is the next bubble that is going to burst. Like if we're not being real with students, I even tell parents with middle school students, you need to tell them the reality of how student loans work early on because you don't want them to be 40 and 50 years old still paying off student loans. But while they're in middle school and they can begin to work for scholarships, and look for ways to take care of their education if that's what they want to do. You have to have that conversation early. It they're they 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 get it. All the things that kids can see and have access to now, do you think they won't understand? They will understand, but we have to be okay with keeping it real and having the conversation with them. Couldn't agree more. It's never too early to start. So Patrice, you and I certainly champion the concept of uh, pay equity for women. As we wrap up, what what thoughts do you have about how women in the world of work can better self-advocate for themselves to, to ask for those raises or negotiate that starting salary? Because I think we need to take responsibility in the problem as well and come up with solutions. I so wholeheartedly agree with you. And I actually um, started a movement called the Earn More Money Movement for Women for this very reason, because the, the statistics about, um, you know, a woman has to work an extra two months out of the year to make the same pay as a man mm-hmm. um, in a year. And, you know, that 79 percent or I'm sorry, that we make 79 cents on the dollar and all these things, you know. I, a lot of people question whether the statistics are real. I talk to women every day, and I know that many of them are real, are real oh, yeah. and, and very close to being accurate on the money, right? But before we can force any employer, any corporations, any industries to do anything, I really believe it'd be so much easier, again, I believe in keeping it real, if we forced ourselves to step up and do our part to close the wage gap. And I think so often as a personal finance um you know, author and speaker, and I'm all over, people will say, well, I would save more, Patrice, if I earn more, or I would love to start investing if I earn more. I'd totally be debt-free if I earn more. And I got to the point, Caroline, when I was like, well, doggone it, let's start earning more. Yeah, and let's let's stop waiting for the employer to make it right. That's going to take a long time, and I'm not willing to wait just for that. I want to be proactive in the conversation. 
That's it. It's about being proactive. So I started the Earn More Money movement. It said, I will earn more.com. And I wanted to share 25 principles that have helped me as well as clients that I've served, um, you know, create multiple six-figure businesses and, and step up and use my gifts, not just as an entrepreneur, but even in the workplace. I was on the Steve Harvey talk show earlier this year. And I was coaching on, on set a woman who had been in a, a law firm for 13 years, was getting excellent reviews, coming early, leaving late, being the best she could be, and she never asked for the raise. Wow. And when it was time for her next review, she was intimidated to even do her self-evaluation. And so that's a confidence thing. Yeah. You know, that's a confidence thing that we have to address. And I think that as we learn how to face our fears um, and truly understand what our gifts are and align those gifts with different positions and skill sets and those things that we can we can close the wage gap. We can make the difference without having to wait for anyone else to come and save us. And so I have in that principle, it's a totally free challenge. There are 25 principles every day delivered by email. And one of them is to make a brag binder. Ah, love it. It is to remind yourself of how awesome sauce you are <laughs> and why you're there in the first place. And I have had over 7,000 women so far printing down their um, past reviews, printing down thank you notes, collecting those thank you cards from customers or clients or partners, um, you know, getting those certificates in order. And really, I want them before they have these opportunities to ask for the raise or promotion or go after that next job to have a moment to sit and, and cherish all the things that they have contributed to other organizations, to projects, to whatever. And remember, I did that. I did that. And because I did that, I'm worthy of more. I'm worthy to ask for more. It's okay that I want more. And no one gets to judge me for doing so. And I can't tell you, since this challenge has started February 1st, I just had a woman in our private Facebook group who turned down a, a raise I'm sorry, she turned down a promotion because the money did not meet the additional <laughs> work requirements that they wanted. And she was bold enough and confident enough to turn it down. Good that for was her. On, yes. That, and that took courage. It took courage. And we supported her and cheered her on. Do you know three days later, they came back and gave her everything she asked for because she stood her ground? Good for her. That's, I'm so proud. That's amazing. You know, my dear, you are moving the needle. I thank you for that <laughs> quest. That is amazing. You are an extraordinary champion. Let's get to how we can buy your books and follow you online and tap these incredible resources that you put out into the world. Tell us how we can find you. Well, you can find me at realmoneyanswers.com. That's realmoneyanswers.com. And everything about me is there. The books are there. Um, the I Will Earn More movement is there. And anything else you want to know about me. And the books are available everywhere books are sold. I'm so honored to have started out as a, a self-published author. Caroline, I don't know if you know this. I did over 18,000 books as a self-published author. And then HarperCollins reached out to me about Real Money Answers for Every Woman and said, we believe that this book should be on the nightstand of every woman in America. And so it's now available in your local Barnes and Nobles, Targets, Walmarts, everywhere books are so. And I'm so excited to just get this practical wisdom in the hands of more women. Well, I am so grateful for all that you do. And I am thrilled to have had the opportunity to get to know you on the show. And Patrice, I hope our paths cross again soon and in person. Thank you Thanks, so yeah. much. <laughs> what a joy to get to know you. You're a rock star. Thanks, Caroline. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to Your Working Life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. Career and life satisfaction is possible, and it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. My show is now available on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and Stitcher. Leave me a comment because I always appreciate hearing from my listeners. I'm Caroline Dowd Higgins. Take good care.